Up next, an encore power of words with WAMC's Alan Chartok and historian Dr. Richard Fow discussing President Harry Truman's Truman Doctrine speech. It's next. Words are powerful. They cause fear, confusion, and anger. Or they can create shared understanding. But when words are delivered by a powerful political leader, their impact can inspire us to great action. And it is to those words that we turn now. In the power of words. not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. This is the meaning of our liberty and our creed, why men and women and children of every race and every faith can join in celebration across this magnificent mall, and why a man whose father less than 60 years ago might not have been served at a local restaurant, can now stand before you to take a most sacred oath. Hi, this is Alan Chartok. Welcome to The Power of Words, our year-long series of programs that follows American history through some of the most memorable and inspiring political speeches of our time. We continue our series today with President Harry S. Truman's Truman Doctrine speech, delivered March 12, 1947, before a joint session of Congress. Joining us today to help set the scene and analyze the speech is historian Dr. Richard Fow. After 18 years as a college president, Richard Fow has returned to teaching as lecturer in history at Hartwick College in SUNY Albany. An Air Force veteran who served in Iran, he has taught, published, and spoken on U.S. foreign policy, Iran, Islam, and the Middle East. Dr. Fow is president emeritus of Averett University in Virginia, where he served from 2002 to 2008. He started teaching at Dickinson College and then the University of Miami, where he was a tenured member of the graduate faculty. While serving as an Air Force advisor in Iran, he developed a deep appreciation for Farsi and Persian culture. His articles on the United States and Iran have appeared in Diplomatic History and the Middle East Journal, the University Press of Virginia, which published No Sacrifice to Great, his biography of Louis L. Strauss, chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, nominated the book for the Pulitzer Prize. Born in New York City, Dr. Fowle completed his undergraduate degree at Hamilton College and his Ph.D. in history at the University of Virginia. He and his wife reside in her hometown of Sharon Springs, New York. Welcome, Richard Fowle. It's delightful to have you here, and I am really in awe of all of your accomplishments. Well, thank you for uh, inviting me today, Alan. Well, it's terrific to have you for this particular speech, because I have to tell you, Harry Truman is a great hero to me. I've always loved Harry Truman. There is something about a man who can operate under adversity and still come up sort of smelling like roses, and boy, he was his own man, wasn't he? He was his own man. He made his own decisions, and uh, it took him about a year and a half to emerge from the shadow of Franklin Delano Roosevelt and from his uh, exclusion, really, from the halls of power, from serious policy when he served as vice president for those few months before Roosevelt's death. We hear that he never even knew about the atomic bomb. True, because I've done a good bit of work on the bomb and the bomb project, and that would be true. Uh, He learned about it on accepting the office of president in uh, April of 1945. Is there any indication he was a little ticked off about having not been included in the decision-making when Roosevelt died? After all, Roosevelt was not a well man. Nothing that I know of that's in the public record would indicate what his feelings were, although he was very careful in his memoirs to um, mask and shield some of his frustrations and attitudes. On the other hand, he'd he'd been a great senator, a good senator, and uh, probably in his own mind thought he had gone about as far in life as he was going to go when he reached the vice presidency. He had no college degree, not much real formal education, and had been a uh, kind of second-line politician out in uh, Missouri. He was famous for saying what he thought. He was, and for his phrase, the buck stops here. He accepted responsibility for decisions and made them rapidly, which in the case of the Truman Doctrine may or may not have been to his credit. And yet he came out of the Prendergast machine. He was a machine politician. He was a haberdasher, a failed haberdasher. And yet he was a great president, and more and more people are seeing him that way. On the other side, though, he was a captain in the Army during World War One. in he fact, or, or led the firing of one of the last artillery pieces by the United States on Armistice Day in 1918. 
And uh, as one thinks about the uh, the three presidents in the 20th century we regard as activist presidents, Theodore Roosevelt, John Kennedy, and uh, Harry Truman, all three of them were veterans of actual uh, combat. When you say activist, actual fighting. Pres- activist president, what do you mean? Uh, I mean presidents who were active, presidents we think of as vigorous, as decisive, as people who uh, had an impact on American life. Now, obviously, Franklin Roosevelt had a great impact on policy and so on, but the ones we think of as uh, vigorous and uh, maybe even uh, virile would be a good word, and active in their personal lives tend to focus on those three, all of whom share the experience of actual combat for the United States and the armed forces. Now, Richard Fowle, he was a man who did not tolerate fools easily, wasn't he? No. Again, without the formality of an education and degrees and so on, he was uh, remarkably able to uh, distinguish genuine from false. James Burns, his first appointment as Secretary of State, ultimately failed him. He was not loyal to Truman. He was a kind of uh, wanderer around the world, didn't develop a real coherence in foreign policy. When he brought George Marshall in, which he did just before the Truman Doctrine, he had a man whom he regarded, uh, the notes, uh, marginal notes he made on a meeting with his first meeting with Marshall, uh, talk about how great a man Marshall was, as indeed I think he was. He was a man who uh, dismissed Joseph McCarthy as uh, a man uh, peddling red herrings, famously. And, uh, yeah, I think a good judge of human character. I was going to ask you about the dismissal because, you know, Merle Miller wrote this wonderful book about Truman's utterances at different times. Mm -hmm. One gets the feeling, however, that some of that stuff was post hoc pop to hoc. And so uh, one wonders how much of what Truman remembered really happened because (laughs) because his description of what happened when MacArthur kept him waiting for him by the airplane was was really quite something. Yeah, that was MacArthur. I I was, of course, talking about McCarthy, Joseph McCarthy. But Uh but one example that is contemporary, when uh, Soviet Foreign Minister Molotov passed through Washington about two weeks after Truman had become president. So it's very early. It's in April 1945. Molotov's on his way to um, San Francisco for the opening founding meeting of the United Nations. Truman, who had read the uh, Yalta documents, the massive volumes of the meeting between Roosevelt, among Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin to settle the post-war world, and admitted to an aide that he really couldn't make sense out of him because there was so much stuff. Molotov came in, sat down, and uh, Truman upbraided him very directly, so much so, and this, this is in the record at the time, not something Truman later remembered, that Molotov said, I have never been talked to like that in my life. And Truman snapped back, carry out your agreements. He meant the Yalta agreements. And uh, you won't get talked to like that. I can only imagine what Molotov's telegram back to uh, Joseph Stalin would have looked like. We have a man in the White House who is plain spoken, decisive, very different from Franklin Roosevelt, who was suave and diplomatic and said many things without necessarily making clear what he meant. So I, I think there is ample evidence there, at least, of Truman's being extremely direct. You're quite right in catching the difference between MacArthur and McCarthy. Tell me about the famous meeting between MacArthur and Truman. MacArthur and Truman met at Wake Island in the early months of uh, 1951. And at issue between them was the question of what to do about Korea. MacArthur wanted to uh, unleash China. He wanted to uh, perhaps use atomic weapons. He wanted an all-out war with China, which had by then entered the war in Korea. And Truman had decided that wasn't going to happen, that MacArthur ought to keep his mouth shut. When MacArthur leaked to the press his views, the president, I think, had no choice but to fire him, just as in more recent times, President Obama had no choice but to fire General McChrystal in Afghanistan. I think the disloyalty and going public of a man in the military chain of command behind his commander-in-chief or her commander-in-chief is simply uh, unacceptable, no matter who it is. Now, in, in MacArthur's case unlike McChrystal's at least. MacArthur had dreams of grandeur, actually came back, as you remember, may remember, in 1952, and toyed with a run for president. I think I remember being allowed to go home early from school on that day in 1952 to see the parade, watch the parade on television that welcomed MacArthur to uh, New York. When Truman fired him, Truman had to know that he was really taking on a whirlwind. Indeed. And Truman uh, suffered for that for the rest of his time in the uh, in the presidency, although I don't think there's any doubt among historians that it was the right decision oh, made yeah. at the right time by the right man to uh, reinforce civilian control of the military, which is one of the bedrock principles of the United States. So now let's get to the speech. I think the idea that the Truman Doctrine was needed in retrospect is pretty clear, or maybe not. 
Well, I think there's uh, there's room for discussion on that. There would be little doubt that had the United States not intervened, Greece might well have fallen into chaos and communists might have come to power there, although their electoral strength was quite limited in, uh, in early 1947 in Greece. Turkey was under some pressure from the Soviet Union, and uh, there's probably a case to be made for helping shore up the Turkish military so that they could defend the Straits and their common border with the Soviet Union. So in terms of the actions that are part of the Truman Doctrine, the $400 million, the military and civilian aid to both countries, fairly little doubt. Now, on the other hand, when we get from the policy itself to the speech defending it, and explaining it to the American people. Historians certainly have taken issue with the sweeping pronouncement that Truman made in the before the Congress in, uh, in March of 1947, with its commitment to, uh, its endless commitment to goals that were way beyond the means of the United States. When you say way beyond the means, it's one of the richest countries in the world. We had spent many times that, as he points out in his in the speech you're about to hear, folks. We're talking about less than one-tenth of one percent, I believe, of what we had spent on World War II. Yep. Why was it beyond our means? Well, it was beyond our means for this reason. Not so much, again, because of Greece and Turkey which were the immediate situation. George Kennan, who was a part of the policymaking uh, team at the time and, and, and later uh, famous dissenter for what he called, the, what historians call the realist perspective, where the case is made that we need to balance ends and means. It's not so much Greece and Turkey where things work, but it's the idea, as Truman said, of supporting free peoples who are resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities or outside pressure. There's a straight line from that pronouncement to Vietnam. In fact, I, I tried reading the speech and, and thinking about Afghanistan, uh, substituting Afghanistan for Greece, and uh, it's possible to see the, uh, the relationship. It was also uh, grounds on which other countries and other rulers would appeal to the United States for aid against homegrown communists, even if there might be no more than two or three in a population of, of many million, the Shah of Iran being the most classic example, one can argue as well that the uh, interventions of the United States in overthrowing the government, the elected government of uh, Salvador Allende in Chile, of the government in Guatemala in 1954, not to mention Vietnam, that there's a case to be made that by pushing the argument to the limit, the United States assumed obligations to the world and made promises to the world that neither it nor any other nation, even a superpower, could possibly keep. And I think we are relearning in 2010 the limits of our power and the uh, open question in, in, in the present world of whether it is possible to take a military force, even a large, proficient, and, and uh, most effective the world has ever seen military force like ours, take it halfway around the world and teach people to be uh, good, small-D Democrats. So what were the implications here in terms of taking that force halfway around the world? We were giving them money, so how are we going to take a force halfway around yeah, the world? Yeah, good question. We, we were giving them money, and we were sending military advisors. And so we had a clear investment in the military success of the Greek armed forces against the guerrillas in the north. In the end, the Yugoslav, Bulgarian, Romanian, and Soviet decision makers decided to back off. And so the Greeks were able to reestablish control of their territory. They staved off chaos, and it worked well. Why did uh, they back off? The best explanation I can give, and, and again, I have not had access to Soviet documents, in November of 1946, just before the Truman Doctrine, they also backed off in Iran, where they'd been putting significant pressure on the government to try to uh, lop off the northern portion of the country and set up a Soviet-sponsored state there. It would seem that, in retrospect, uh, Soviet foreign policy at this point, when the Soviets had a significant advantage in manpower, six million men under arms to the million that the United States had, were awed by the atomic bomb, which they did not yet possess, mm. and willing, therefore, to back away from areas that did not seem, quotation marks, soft. If they thought they could advance, as they indeed would after the Truman Doctrine in Hungary, Czechoslovakia, they would. Uh, Richard Fowle, do you think there's any indication anywhere that Truman was playing the atomic bomb card? Not here. Not in the Truman Doctrine that I've ever seen, not specifically at this time, but certainly in sending a naval task force to the Eastern Mediterranean at about this time, which included one of the big carriers, the implication that the United States had the weapon, and it was always one of those things that simply didn't have to be stated. I've looked at some of the uh, documents of the uh, Atomic Energy Commission documents, 
And uh, as late as the 1980s, when I was doing this research, the actual number in a memo from the chairman, Lilienthal, to the president was whited out. But one could tell it was a single-digit number. Historians, I think, are agreed now it was probably seven. But seven bombs were enough to devastate seven cities in the Soviet Union. I, I think Soviets were sufficiently cowed by that to not risk confrontation. It is also arguably the case that the Soviet Union, until the invasion of Afghanistan in, in 1979, did not occupy any territory as its part of its empire that its army had not reached as part of the defeat of Germany at the end of the war. Wow. So what should so, we look for in this upcoming speech? We have a sense of Truman as not that dramatic a speaker. No, he's not. In fact, the speech is delivered in a very flat tone of voice. So the first thing I might say in response to that would be listen to the contrast between this speech, interrupted only three times for applause, and the pageantry that surrounds a State of the Union address, let's say, in our own day. So the president went, it was one o'clock in the afternoon, to address the uh, two houses of Congress, the house whose chamber the, the address occurred in, had adjourned about 45 minutes earlier so everybody could get a break and they could make room in the front rows for the senators and other dignitaries. They filed back in. People were finding their seats. Mrs. Truman, in fact, arrived and was unrecognized and was kind of wandering through the crowd until uh, a White House aide found her and got her to her appropriate seat. There's a, there was a little buzz of conversation, particularly some retired members of the House had come back because this was uh, going to be, uh, they thought, a momentous occasion. Then people settled down, and Truman, in a very flat, matter-of-fact, almost uninflected voice, delivers this speech, which I think bespeaks an age in American history when speeches mattered more as text than perhaps as the pageantry of theater that we're used to now with television, with C-SPAN indeed having turned the House and Senate into daily uh, doses of political theater. Although, so that would be the first thing I'd say we'd listen for. Although FDR, of course, preceded Truman, and he knew how to sell the potatoes. Yeah, master of the fireside chat. And it, there may be a, contra a deliberate contrast there, too, because Truman was certainly not the speaker Roosevelt was, didn't have the personality, didn't have the charisma, didn't have the... Uh, the articulate skill with words that FDR had. So there may have been a deliberate contrast. Truman also uh, very consciously avoided quoting in his mm -hmm. addresses. One of the State Department drafts had had a quotation from uh, former Secretary of State Burns, and uh, the White House staff struck that. They left some of the words in but didn't attribute it. So he may have been quite deliberately uh, distancing himself from his predecessor. What else do we want to look for here? Okay, certainly uh, watch for the difference between the uh, amount of time he spends on Greece and the amount of time he spends on Turkey. And what's the implication there? Well, the implication for that is the situation in Greece was easy to understand. It was tragic. It was poignant. It involved real people who were suffering, and it was a clear example of people whose situation seemed to clamor for relief, which the money from the United States could provide. And of course, there are a lot more Greeks in the United States well, than there second, were Turks. Second, there are a lot more <laughs> Greeks in the United States than there are Turks. Third, Greece had suffered significantly in the war, had been invaded by Italy and Germany, uh, occupied during the war, and, and there was significant suffering. The Greeks also were Christians, and I think all of those would be one set of issues. In Turkey, on the other hand, the question is not so much one of imminent starvation, but of geostrategic thought, which American, the American people were not used to. Turkey, as well, was not suffering, and Turkey was, of course, Muslim, and uh, I think a little more difficult to get sympathy. Greece was, I guess, in the minds and memories of many Americans, uh, the very symbol of democracy. In fact, one of the discussions before the speech among the members of Congress, uh, senior members of Congress, and State Department personnel in the president's office uh, under Secretary of State Acheson made the case that the world as he perceived it, and he wanted the Congress people to perceive it in 1947, was a world of two superpowers just as in the days of Athens and Sparta or Rome and Carthage. So conjuring up those ancient images, very important. Third, or uh, whatever number we're up to, last thing to look for in the speech is the distinction between the two ways of life. Because the president, in making this appeal, and responding to the, the insistence of the members of Congress that if they were going to legislate $400 million, particularly a, uh, a Republican Congress that was bent on cutting taxes and cutting the budget, they needed to have a universal, cosmic, great cause. And so what Truman does is contrast the free democratic institutions of the United States with the totalitarian institutions of the people on the other side. So one might listen for that as well. Well, this is all so fascinating. I have a thousand more questions, and we'll ask them when we come back. Let's listen to the speech right now. Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, 
members of the Congress of the United States. The gravity of the situation which confronts the world today necessitates my appearance before a joint session of the Congress. The foreign policy and the national security of this country are involved. One aspect of the present situation, which I present to you at this time for your consideration and decision, concerns Greece and Turkey. The United States has received from the Greek government an urgent appeal for financial and economic assistance. Preliminary reports from the American Economic Mission now in Greece and reports from the American Ambassador in Greece corroborate the statement of the Greek government that assistance is imperative if Greece is to survive as a free nation. I do not believe that the American people in the Congress wish to turn a deaf ear to the appeal of the Greek government. Greece is not a rich country. Lack of sufficient natural resources has always forced the Greek people to work hard to make both ends meet. Since 1940, this industrious, peace-loving country has suffered invasion, four years of cruel enemy occupation, and bitter internal strife. When forces of liberation entered Greece, they found that the retreating Germans had destroyed virtually all the railways, roads, port facilities, communications, and merchant marine. More than a thousand villages had been burned. Eighty-five percent of the children were tubercular. Livestock, poultry, and draft animals had almost disappeared. Inflation had wiped out practically all savings. As a result of these tragic conditions, a militant minority exploiting human want and misery was able to create political chaos, which until now has made economic recovery impossible. Greece is today without funds to finance the importation of those goods which are essential to bare subsistence. Under these circumstances, the people of Greece cannot make progress in solving their problems of reconstruction. Greece is in desperate need of financial and economic assistance to enable it to resume purchases of food, clothing, fuel, and seeds. These are indispensable for the subsistence of its people and are obtainable only from abroad. Greece must have help to import the goods necessary to restore internal order and security so essential for economic and political recovery. The Greek government has also asked for the assistance of experienced American administrators, economists, and technicians to ensure that the financial and other aid given to Greece shall be used effectively in creating a stable and self-sustaining economy and in improving its public administration. The very existence of the Greek state is today threatened by the terrorist activities of several thousand armed men led by communists who defy the government's authority at a number of points, particularly along the northern boundaries. A commission appointed by the United Nations Security Council is at present investigating disturbed conditions in northern Greece and alleged border violations along the frontiers between Greece on the one hand and Albania, Bulgaria, and Yugoslavia on the other. Meanwhile, the Greek government is unable to cope with the situation. The Greek army is small and poorly equipped. It needs supplies and equipment if it is to restore authority to the government throughout Greek territory. Greece must have assistance if it is to become a self-supporting and self-respecting democracy. The United States must supply this assistance. We have already extended to Greece certain types of relief and economic aid, but these are inadequate. There is no other country to which democratic Greece can turn. No other nation is willing and able to provide the necessary support for a democratic Greek government.
the British government, which has been helping Greece, can give no further financial or economic aid after March 31st. Great Britain finds itself under the necessity of reducing or liquidating its commitments in several parts of the world, including Greece. We have considered how the United Nations might assist in this crisis, but the situation is an urgent one, requiring immediate action. And the United Nations and its related organizations are not in a position to extend help of the kind that is required. It is important to note that the Greek government has asked for our aid in utilizing effectively the financial and other assistance we may give to Greece and in improving its public administration. It is of the utmost importance that we supervise the use of any funds made available to Greece. In such a manner that each dollar spent will count toward making Greece self-supporting and will help to build an economy in which a healthy democracy can flourish. No government is perfect. One of the chief virtues of a democracy, however, is that its defects are always visible and under democratic processes can be pointed out and corrected. The government of Greece is not perfect. Nevertheless, it represents 85% of the members of the Greek parliament who were chosen in an election last year Foreign observers, including 692 Americans, considered this election to be a fair expression of the views of the Greek people. The Greek government has been op operating in an atmosphere of chaos and extremism. It has made mistakes. The extension of aid by this country does not mean that the United States condones everything that the Greek government has done or will do. We have condemned in the past and we condemn now extremist measures of the right or the left. We have in the past advised tolerance, and we advise tolerance now. The Greek's neighbor, Turkey, also deserves our attention. The future of Turkey as an independent and economically sound state is clearly no less important to the freedom-loving peoples of the world than the future of Greece. The circumstances in which Turkey finds itself today are considerably different from those of Greece. Turkey has been spared the disasters that have beset Greece, and during the war, the United States and Great Britain furnished Turkey with material aid. Nevertheless, Turkey now needs our support. Since the war, Turkey has sought additional financial assistance from Great Britain and the United States for the purpose of effecting that modernization necessary for the maintenance of its national integrity. That integrity is essential to the preservation of order in the Middle East. The British government has informed us that, owing to its own difficulties, it can no longer extend financial or economic aid to Turkey. As in the case of Greece, if Turkey is to have the assistance it needs, the United States must supply it. We are the only country able to provide that help. I am fully aware of the broad implications involved if the United States extends assistance to Greece and Turkey, and I shall discuss these implications with you at this time. One of the primary objectives of the foreign policy of the United States is the creation of conditions in which we and other nations will be able to work out a way of life free from coercion. This was a fundamental issue in the war with Germany and Japan. Our victory was won over countries which sought to impose their will and their way of life upon other nations. To ensure the peaceful development of nations free from coercion, the United States has taken a leading part in establishing the United Nations. The United Nations is designed to make possible lasting freedom and independence for all its members. We shall not realize our objectives, however, unless we are willing to help free peoples to maintain their free institutions and their national integrity against aggressive movements that seek to impose upon them totalitarian regimes.
This is no more than a frank recognition that totalitarian regimes imposed upon free peoples by direct or indirect aggression undermine the foundations of international peace and hence the security of the United States. The peoples of a number of countries of the world have recently had totalitarian regimes forced upon them against their will. The government of the United States has made frequent protests against coercion and intimidation in violation of the Yalta Agreement in Poland, Romania, and Bulgaria. I must also state that in a number of other countries, there have been similar developments. At the present moment in world history, nearly every nation must choose between alternative ways of life. The choice is too often not a free one. One way of life is based upon the will of the majority and is distinguished by free institutions, representative government, free elections, guarantees of individual liberty, freedom of speech and religion, and freedom from political oppression. The second way of life is based upon the will of a minority, forcibly imposed upon the majority. It relies upon terror and oppression, a, control, a controlled press and radio, fixed elections, and the suppression of personal freedoms. I believe that it must be the policy of the United States to support free peoples who are resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities or by outside pressures. I believe that we must assist free peoples to work out their own destinies in their own way. I believe that our help should be primarily through economic and financial aid, which is essential to economic stability and orderly political processes. The world is not static, and the status quo is not sacred. But we cannot allow changes in the status quo in violation of the Charter of the United Nations by such methods as coercion or by subterfuges, such subterfuges as political infiltration. In helping free and independent nations to maintain their freedom, the United States will be giving effect to the principles of the Charter of the United Nations. It is necessary only to glance at a map to realize that the survival and integrity of the Greek nation are of grave importance in a much wider situation. If Greece should fall under the control of an armed minority, the effect upon its neighbor Turkey would be immediate and serious. Confusion and disorder might well spread throughout the entire Middle East. Moreover, the disappearance of Greece as an independent state would have a profound effect upon those countries in Europe whose peoples are struggling against great difficulties to maintain their freedoms and their independence while they repair the damages of war. It would be an unspeakable tragedy if these countries, which have struggled so long against overwhelming odds, should lose that victory for which they sacrificed so much. Collapse of free institutions, and loss of independence would be disastrous not only for them, but for the world. Discouragement and possibly failure would quickly be the lot of neighboring peoples striving to maintain their freedom and independence. Should we fail to aid Greece and Turkey in this faithful hour, the effect will be far-reaching to the West as well as to the East. We must take immediate and resolute action. I therefore ask the Congress to provide authority for assistance to Greece and Turkey in the amount of $400 million for the period ending June 30, 1948. In requesting these funds, I have taken into consideration the maximum amount of relief assistance which would be furnished to Greece out of the $350 million which I recently requested that the Congress authorize for the prevention of starvation and suffering in countries devastated by the war. In addition to funds, 
I ask the Congress to authorize the detail of American civilian and military personnel to Greece and Turkey at the request of those countries to assist in the tasks of reconstruction and for the purpose of supervising the use of such financial and material assistance as may be furnished. I recommend that authority also be provided for the instruction and training of selected Greek and Turkish personnel. Finally, I ask that the Congress provide authority which will permit the speediest and most effective use in terms of needed commodities, supplies, and equipment of such funds as may be authorized. If further funds or further authority should be needed for the purposes indicated in this message, I shall not hesitate to bring the situation before the Congress. On this subject, the executive and legislative branches of the government must work together. This is a serious course upon which we embark. I would not recommend it, except that the alternative is much more serious. The United States contributed... The United States contributed $341 billion toward winning World War II. This is an investment in world freedom and world peace. The assistance that I'm recommending for Greece and Turkey amounts to a little more than one-tenth of one percent of this investment. It is only common sense that we should safeguard this investment and make sure that it was not in vain. The seeds of totalitarian regimes are nurtured by misery and want. They spread and grow in the evil soil of poverty and strife. They reach their full growth when the hope of a people for a better life has died. We must keep that hope alive. The free peoples of the world look to us for support in maintaining their freedoms. If we falter in our leadership, we may endanger the peace of the world, and we shall surely endanger the welfare of this nation. Great responsibilities have been placed upon us by the swift movement of events. I am confident that the Congress will face these responsibilities squarely. Okay, so we've heard the speech, Professor Richard Fow, set the context of what was going on in the world at the time. Good question. There are a number of things that serve as a backdrop for what Truman would actually say. Maybe in some ways because it was the precipitating event, the British withdrawal from empire, the British recognition in the fall of 1946 on into now the first months of 1947 that they had come out of the war poor. They were no longer They able. were broke. They were broke. They were absolutely flat broke. They had a coal shortage, which caused rationing of uh, heating and of electricity in Britain in the early months of 1947. And the British cabinet finally agreed that they were going to need to shed their empire. So this is the moment when India is going to gain its freedom, be separated into India and Pakistan. It's the moment when they're going to withdraw from their Palestinian mandate, and uh, they're essentially pulling back. They realize they could not any longer provide monetary or military support to Greece and Turkey. And so it was really the British who, in February of 1947, came to the United States, the American State Department, and said, look, we can't do this anymore. Will you pick up the burden? And so for some historians, this is the moment when world leadership of the, uh, at least the portion of the world that the United States would lead, as opposed to the Soviet portion, passed to the United States, when the British Empire essentially comes to a, an end, and the United States steps forward to provide the initially the aid to Greece and Turkey, and then even more, as occurred after the, uh, the Truman Doctrine speech. I was also wondering when you were speaking earlier, Richard, about the concept of how um, Turkey played a role in the Korean War. Uh, good question. Turkish troops fought and fought and, well. Yeah, well, they, were held, the they were passionate. Yeah. Uh, yeah, interesting issue. Turkey, uh, as we've seen, as we've heard, did not really figure in the speech. I mean, he, he mentions it, but it's mentioned passing. The explanation I've seen for that among the uh, the accounts at the time and after is that 
The issue in Turkey was subtle. It was hard to understand. And uh, so Truman decided he would he would simply mute it. The issue there was that Turkey controlled the straits, the vital straits that linked the Black Sea to the Mediterranean. And Turkey bordered Iran. And Turkey was, because of its geographic position, a block preventing Soviet expansion into its neighbors, uh, its Islamic neighbors, Syria, Iraq, and perhaps even further into the Islamic Middle East. That, though, Truman decided was really a little more complicated and subtle than the American people were ready to understand in the spring of 1947. So he muted it. What happened in the event was the U.S. sent military advisors and uh, re-equipped or shored up the equipment of the uh, Turkish military. There was a bit of a problem early on because the Turkish military was largely using German equipment because they'd been allied with Germany in the First World War and had remained uh, in a relationship with Germany thereafter. But we had a bunch of captured German stuff from Europe, which we sent to them, and then they were then they were working with the U.S. equipment, certainly by the uh, time of the Korean War. Interesting, though, that as Turkey's democracy unfolded, in 1950, the uh, opponents of Kemal Ataturk came to power, the first time that the opposition party had come to power, and three times... In the following uh, several decades, the Turkish military, the U.S.-trained Turkish military, intervened to dismiss the civilian government in 1960, 70, and 1983. And so one wonders whether the uh, Truman Doctrine speech's commitment to democracy and free institutions and a free press is really, uh, in the case of Turkey in particular, one that the Turkish military shared. And, of course, every now and then, as the uh, more militant, more uh, Islamic party in Turkey is now in power, uh, every now and then there are rumbles and questions about whether the military may intervene again. Right Turkey, now, we're still seeing that. Yeah, yeah absolutely, in the present yeah. day. So Turkey, a uh, little different situation from uh, Greece. George Kennan argued, and I think persuasively that the aid to Greece was a good idea. Greece was in chaos. The political situation, the economic situation, the social situation in Greece were dire, and people actually were starving. Uh, And so not much issue about intervening in Greece. Most of it was foreign exchange money that the Greeks could use to balance their budget and buy things. Again, you know, la plus change la même chose. Here we are with the Greek government again trying to balance its budget with foreign loans. But in Turkey, Kennan argued, we might be militarizing our foreign policy, which might not be a good idea, militarizing our foreign aid, which might not be a good idea. And he said, look, if the uh, Soviet Union and indigenous communist parties were to attempt to move into the world of Islam, they probably weren't going to get very far in the long run that even swallowing Turkey or trying to swallow Iraq or part of Iran might in the long run prove indigestible for the Soviet Union because of the fundamental um, antipathy between the godly, worshipful people of Islam and the specific rejection of religion by the atheists of the Soviet Union. And we certainly saw that in Afghanistan years later. But of course, what I'm fascinated by in the Turks, and perhaps we're going too far into this, is the Ataturk secular philosophy of Turkey as opposed to more traditional Muslim-run countries. And that had to have some influence on the thinkers in the State Department and others. Absolutely it did. And I think one of the themes of the Cold War was that the more adept people from another country were at speaking the language of national security, at looking like, acting like, and perhaps talking like American military or civilian bureaucrats, uh, the more likely they were to get our support. The Shah of Iran is the classic case of manipulating the uh, American officials from FDR all the way forward through uh, Jimmy Carter of speaking the language of national security and raising the specter periodically of domestic communist political opposition as a lever to uh, equip his forces with the latest American military equipment and to ensure a strong guarantee of Iran's security against its neighbor, the Soviet Union. So when we are done with the Truman administration and in comes the Eisenhower administration, and at the end of the Eisenhower administration, we are treated to this military industrial complex quote from General Ike, which has become so important. One wonders whether or not the Truman Doctrine, and I think you're implying this, didn't in some way get us into this military-industrial thing to begin with. Uh, I would argue that the line is direct and straight, and that although Eisenhower, having known war as only a man in his position could have known war, was reluctant to commit American forces to new ventures in the sense of conventional military, and in fact tried to shrink the military, partly as a way to keep the U.S. out of adventures 
So that said, I think points us in one direction. However, it was also Eisenhower who in 1953 in Iran and 1954 in Guatemala uh, used the CIA to overthrow quite legitimately uh, chosen popular governments, which would seem to suggest that the Truman Doctrine is something we honor when it suits us and will twist it just slightly when it doesn't. That is, the argument was made in both Guatemala and Iran that the governments were not actually, they were not really freely elected governments, and therefore we need to overthrow them. In fact, they fit the definition of Truman's armed minorities imposing their will on the majority and repressing the press and so on. So what was the reaction to the speech? The reaction to the speech was generally positive, generally favorable. Senator Vandenberg, the leading Republican on the uh, Foreign Relations Committee of Vandenberg of Michigan, shepherded, as did the rest of the Republican leadership, shepherded the legislation through Congress, the Foreign million was appropriated and provided. And also with the permission of Congress, U.S. advisors went to Greece and went to Turkey and began to uh, work with their counterparts in those countries. So I think there was a positive reaction as I listened to the speech, the aftermath, the applause. I think people in the immediate uh, delivery, following the immediate delivery of the message, were somewhat bewildered about what it meant. And then as they read it, they came to see that the president had made a case for specifically aiding Greece and Turkey, but doing it in a larger context of a contest in which the very existence of the United States was at stake. He never mentioned the USSR, never said the words Soviet Union, though the word communist appears a couple of times. Um, which was quite deliberate, again, on his part, to avoid provoking the Soviets and prov avoid provoking a reaction, because we, really we really weren't sure what the Russians were going to do. Now, they didn't like it very much. They saw the U.S. now as moving into a forward position, as clearly opposing Soviet interests, and uh, as a result, they ensured a friendly government in Hungary, brought Czechoslovakia into more fully into their orbit, and eventually will uh, both develop their own atomic weapons, which they were feverishly at work on in 1947. And, and we know how they were at work at it, stealing it from us. And well, we know we know that they got a good bit of the information <laughs> from us. I mean, the general, uh, Robert Oppenheimer, the father of the bomb, once said that the physics is simple. Any student of physics can understand how it works. The keys were first the metallurgy to create enough plutonium or purified uranium to do the bomb. That was the first part. And then the second part was the design of the uh, bomb stuff itself, which had to be safe enough to handle in most of its life, but then would suddenly uh, implode, as the plutonium device says, or smash together, as the one used at Hiroshima did, uh, in order to create the chain reaction and set off the explosion. So there was metallurgy, and there was, um, uh, uh, well, really in both cases, I guess there, there are fields of metallurgy and physics, industrial processes, more than they are, uh, you know, secrets, if you will, of the uh, of the bomb. But certainly, the, we know now the atomic bomb project was penetrated. In fact, we know that. We knew it then. We knew it as early as 1950, when Klaus Fuchs, the uh, German-born British physicist, confessed that he'd been a, uh, a spy for the Soviet Union. That said, however, the spying probably got the bomb more quickly for the Soviet Union than they otherwise would, but I think there's no doubt they would have developed it, it was on their inevitable. own. It was inevitable. So are you implying <laughs> that the Cold War could be, in some way, laid at the feet of Harry Truman. Indeed. I would argue that the Cold War was a confrontation between two powerful nations which had conflicting interests and expectations about how the world would work economically and politically. And in the case of both, of each, a set of leaders and ideology that thought each country believed itself to be, is probably the better way to say it, the sole possessor of truth. So in a sense, there is tragedy in this. Was the Cold War as it unfolded, therefore inevitable? I would suggest not. As Henry Wallace, Secretary of Agriculture, argued in September of 1946, a speech for which he was fired, coexistence with the Soviet Union was possible. Certainly we reached that point once we got to the balance of terror in the 19, late 1950s. And uh, competition could occur by other means than, uh, than confrontation. And that the effect domestically on uh, freedom of speech, on freedom of thought in the United States may not have been worth the effort. Wow. So would I argue that there's a lot of responsibility to be spread around? I would indeed. And I would argue that in elevating the question of aid to Greece and Turkey to an all-embracing threat to our civilization, that President Truman committed a um, mistake, 
uh, although there's an understanding, I think there's an easy way to understand it, uh, which is not dissimilar from the argument that al-Qaeda somehow was a threat to American civilization, a small group who could certainly inflict heinous crimes and grievous injury on the United States. There's no argument about that. But whether they were a threat to our civilization is, is much less clear. In Truman's case, the geostrategic argument that Secretary of State Marshall and Undersecretary Atchison presented to the senior leaders of Congress in the president's office on February the 27th of 1947 didn't take the representatives and senators present started asking whether we were simply pulling British chestnuts out of the fire, somehow saving, becoming the agents for the British, or whether, uh, in fact, anything was really at stake for the United States. And at that point, Under Secretary Atchison, much schooled in and one of the early uh, committed to the Cold War, launched into his speech, or launched into his speech, not necessarily prepared, but emotional and passionate, in which he said, essentially, there are two civilizations here, echoing themes in his description of the Soviet Union that we had applied to uh, Nazi Germany, and essentially saying it's the same enemy in that it's a totalitarian government, making the case for a universal crusade to defeat these people. Mm. And in so doing, uh, when he finished, the congressmen were awed. They were silent. They were quiet. Actually, even Vandenberg, who was a very voluble man, was quiet. And they said, look, this is impressive stuff. If you want us to be able to vote for the appropriation, you'd better get this to the American people so they hear it as well. And, of course, that's the genesis of the speech that we've heard. Now, Vandenberg, of course, had been an isolationist before the Second World War, came around, survived politically. So I want to ask you about the relationship in context here of the Republicans and the Democrats in the United States Congress and their relationship with Truman. Good question. Again, the Republicans had swept into control of both the Senate and the House in 1946. Uh, they were not yet the do-nothing Congress uh, against whom Truman ran in 1948. That comes later. But they came into office on the slogan, had enough, by which they meant enough government regulation, enough control, enough taxes. And their program essentially was to uh, cut income taxes by 20 percent, to free business from the uh, wartime controls, which Truman had been relaxing only, only gradually. And when Truman brought in his budget to cut the uh, spending by one-sixth, from 37 and a half to 31 and a half billions of dollars. Sounds like a paltry sum against the numbers we use now. So cutting taxes, deregulating, and cutting the budget was the program. However, because of the dire situation in the world and the presidents and the State Department leaders' effective arguments that the United States did not dare to retreat from world politics as it had after World War I, so one of the uh, so-called lessons of World War I was that the United States retreated from world politics, then aggressors might be encouraged. Determined not to make that mistake, Vandenberg, who was the most influential Republican voice in foreign affairs, uh, Robert Taft, probably close second, but Vandenberg was really the man, working from the premise that politics stops at the water's edge, mm -hmm. famous phrase of the late 40s and sure. 50s, created what amounted to a bipartisan support for the uh, U.S. effort in the Cold War that continued right on through the Eisenhower years and uh, perhaps only fell apart when we get to Vietnam. The other contextual issue, of course, in this speech is the U.N. itself. Yeah, uh, the United Nations began work in San Francisco, as I said earlier, in 1945. It held its first session in New York at Lake Success in uh, the spring of 1946 and dealt there with its first crisis, really, was the refusal of the Soviet Union to withdraw its forces from northern Iran in March of 1946, as they were supposed to do under the wartime agreements. And uh, the U.N. proved, though, unable to really effect a solution there. Ultimately, the Soviets backed off because of issues having to do with American power, Iran, Iranian uh, resilience and uh, their recognition that this was not a, quote, soft target. But Truman refers to the U.N. in the speech and he essentially says the U.N. is a good thing and we like it, but it really isn't prepared to act in this kind of situation because it can't act quickly and it can't act precisely. The U.N. had no forces. The U.N. had no money. And uh, the U.N. had a security council with a Russian veto. Indeed, where the Soviet Union could veto. The United Nations, he said, is uh, designed to make possible lasting freedom and independence Independence for all its members, but it really isn't able to move quickly in this kind of situation, and therefore will essentially bypass the UN. Ethan Thea Harris, an important historian on the left, has argued that when the United States acts unilaterally, it is somehow in keeping with the uh, purposes of the United Nations. When the U.S. intervenes militarily, it is somehow for peace. 
And when the U.S. acts out of self-interest, it is somehow for the interest of the world. Now, I'm not sure I would be quite as dismissive as uh, Dr. Thea Harris, but certainly in this situation, at least, the United States was acting out of a sense of its own interests, although in trying to sell its strategy, its politics to the American people, the administration did reach for excessive rhetoric in describing the uh, how dire the situation was and creating the justification and demand for the U.S. to act. So if the president of the United States, I'm following your argument here, if the president of the United States does this unilateral thing and doesn't put its marbles at the United Nations, could we say that in some ways that disabled the United Nations in the future? That's, I think, something that one might be able to say. What sorts of situations has the UN dealt with successfully in the sense of getting them from crisis, whatever the form of the crisis is, to resolution? Some issues involving smaller countries, some issues that seem to be tractable, like feeding people. And the UN has provided a uh, certainly a forum for the nations of the world to come together, even those that don't recognize one another diplomatically, the U.S. and Cuba, for example. So the UN has good, but whether that good extends to uh, dealing with conflicts of fundamental and vital interest between great nations, superpowers, it's less clear. The UN was founded, I suppose, on the premise and in the hope that the wartime coalition would continue and that the friendship of the United States and Soviet Union in particular, Britain, France, China, the other members of the Security Council, permanent members, would go on. And of course, tragically, it did not. So I might argue that the UN's relatively less effective role in the world stems from that more than from the uh, the Truman Doctrine itself. Well, we're almost out of time, but one of the great debates about the history of the United Nations is the fact that as the United States got into the Korean involvement, the Soviets walked out. Yeah, and, you know, fortuitous coincidence. The Soviets weren't there, and so the Security Council voted to make the, uh, well, clearly the Korean they, War clearly, a U.N. venture. Don't you think that the Russians knew what the consequences of their not being there would be? Well, there's a league of American officials who say, uh, no, boy, we snookered them. But I think you're probably right, that they must have uh, seen. They also could see that the cards were stacked against them and perhaps saw the walkout as a way to declare the process a mockery. That would be the best I could do. But perhaps also to avoid needing to cast their veto and possibly risk a change in the U.N. charter that would deny them Mm. the veto. So there may have been all sorts of dimensions of this. That uh, You see, that's what I uh, think. I think had Truman stayed with the United Nations, there was a very good chance that there would have been an evolution in order to make it a more productive and activist body. And that you may well be right, you know, about that. But by going unilaterally, he may have created an issue here. Well, certainly he created the precedent that the United States could and would act unilaterally and uh, that we might justify that action by appealing to the charter, to the principles of the United Nations, even though we were acting on our own behalf and, and, and thus cloaking unilateral American action as if it were somehow multilateral and international. Unfortunately, we are out of time. I want to thank our expert today, historian Dr. Richard Fow. Thanks also to our producer, David Gustino, the Truman Library and the Museum for providing the speech. And a special thanks to Bob Bullock from the Archives Partnership Trust. Be sure to join us next time for another discussion about a great political speech on the power of words. Thank you.